Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day to be alive. Amen. I'd like to also thank the church and all the people that helped uh, yesterday. That was quite a movement. Quite a movement. These uh, ladies and men worked so hard, and it was amazing to see everybody come together like that. It's hard to get that many people together without some kind of a quarrel, but it never happened. Amen? Uh, yeah, last week, it was, a, it was a rough week for my family, as you all know. Um, we lost Paula's mom, uh, the funeral. We laid her to rest last Thursday. She was a very good lady. You know, we had our differences, me and Joyce, but you know what? I loved her and she loved me. And I guess I wouldn't be the right son-in-law if you didn't give the mother-in-law a hard time, right? I always said, I, me and Calvin, me, I call him Calvin, me and Calvin were the, were the favorite son-in-laws. Of course, that's all there is, me and him. So, but no, she had a good sense of humor and she loved life. She loved to live life. Uh, she sure loved to go out with her girls and go out to eat, go on cruises, go jewelry shopping. I mean, I don't even ask. When they would go out, it's like, whatever. They come back from one cruise, and I heard them talking, and I said, I already called her Joycey. I said, Joycey, just what happened on that cruise? I said, my wife is with you. Did you do something wrong? She goes, listen. <laughs> she goes, what happens on the cruise ship stays on the cruise ship. And you mind your own business daily. <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am. And no, she, she was a lot of fun to be around. And, you know, looking back at her life, and, and I, I don't doubt that this will be the way for most of us, that depending on what happens. But, you know, they were married for how many years, as so many in here have, and your spouse passed away. And, you know, I believe part of you goes with the spouse. Part of you dies with your spouse. I mean, that, they were together their whole life, basically. They did everything together. And when one leaves, see, she was never the same. She was never, never the same afterwards. She was always the same about believing in her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, believing in the Word. But when it comes to doing things, it wasn't as fun as it used to be. And, you know, my wife would you know, do everything to get her out of the house. And once in a while, she'd get out, but she was ready to go back home. And um, I can see where it'd be easy to be that way. I really do. Because when part of you's gone and the one that you did everything with, and, uh, but she did live a full, full life. I mean, she, she was full of life and, and joy and happiness, smiling. And my wife looks just like her. And I told my wife, I said, every time I see you, I see your mama. <laughs> but no, she, I'm going to miss her dearly. And thank you for the church, and thank you for all the people who uh, came and all the ones that sent beautiful flowers and all the messages of encouragement, everything. We thank everybody here from the bottom of our hearts, the whole family does. We knew that a lot of you couldn't make it um, just because of the way, the, what time it was and everything, but it is what it is, and it's okay. It's all, it's all okay. And the other thing that happened to us on the same day that she passed, she passed, I think, at 2.30 in the morning, and I believe it was at 9.45. Paula gets a phone call that my grandson, Dakota, they went down to races down in Crawfordville with a four-wheeler thing they race. And uh, he was in a really, you know, all we heard was he's in a really bad wreck. The ambulance was taking him away, and it's like, you know, Paula and I just both fell apart. It's like. God, don't let this be. You know, we didn't know if he was going to live. We didn't know how bad it was. We just knew it was bad. Thank God. You know, they didn't know the extent of the injury, so they got him to the hospital and uh, got all his gear off of him, did all the tests and all the, you know, the x-rays and MRIs. And they were worried about head injury, worried about internal trauma. They were worried about everything. And uh, I guess you want to say, thank goodness, his leg only, but he's got a two foot long rod in one leg and plates and screws on the other bone holding it together and doctor said he's got a long road and if anybody can relate to that it would definitely be sister sarah and brother jimmy it's kind of the same break that bo had right and it's it's going to be pretty painful correct 
I never had one like that, but everybody says they're not, it's not, you don't get over it quick. So I really, our family covets your prayers for him, you know, just like Bo, you know, young man in their prime, go, 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 and all of a sudden his life stopped. And we, we knew it was coming, but he's already going through a depression. And I hate seeing that. I absolutely hate it. He's such a good, I call him a kid. He's 20 years old. Uh, he's still a kid to me. And uh, I just, it just breaks my heart to see my, any of my children hurt, any of them. And, uh, and knowing that he can't get around. I mean, I can't hardly even take him out of that where he is. I mean, if he moves at all very much, his legs start swelling up. Um, they had to take him back to the hospital at uh, Lafayette already because his legs were swelling up. They said it's normal, but be careful what he does. Can you get infection in that open wound where the bones come through the skin? You get infection real easy, and you don't want that. So, uh, yeah, I, we covered your prayers. I, it's um, I for, for Dakota because I, I couldn't imagine being that age and having everything that I, I love to do just stopped. And his whole summer now is going to be taken from this, minimum his whole summer. So pray for him. If you ever want to visit, just let me or Paula know, and we'll make sure, you know, he's okay to visit. But I'm sure he would enjoy somebody visiting, talking to him. Just let him know you, you love him and you care for him. Send him a text. If you don't have a cell number, uh, Paula can give it to you or Faith can give it to you. He loves texting. He loves, you know, that kind of stuff. So, okay, I'll get past all that. <laughs> and uh, my, my sermon today, I thought about this all week. And I, last week I had a sermon for Mother's Day, and we know how that worked out. Uh, it didn't. And um, so this week, you know, I, I, it's been on my heart all week. And last night in the middle of the night I woke up thinking about it. You know, church, we need to prepare for the battle. We need to prepare for the battle. And uh, that starts with me. When I'm preaching today, I'm preaching to me, just so you know it. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of examples in the Bible. And um, I'll read a scripture. If you'd all stand and go to Acts. Let's go to chapter 5, uh, verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Pastor Jimmy, can you ask the blessing on the word? Amen. You may all be seated. My mind took me to Moses and Pharaoh when this first come to me. And you know, Pharaoh was given ten plagues to let his to let God's people go. And you know, Everything in this Bible, from the beginning to the end, I haven't seen anything yet that we can't put ourselves in the middle of that and be in a parable of what's happening in our life. Yeah. You can put ourselves in that place. Not that we're holding people hostage and bondage, but things in our life that hold us bondage, that are keeping us from being who we're supposed to be. And he had all these different plagues that turned on him and the first one is interesting. Um, we would go ahead and turn to Exodus uh, chapter 7, verse 10. And the, these things are interesting. Uh, Exodus um, chapter 7, verse 10. This is where Moses and Aaron went in, went in unto Pharaoh. And let me keep reading. And they did so as the Lord had commanded, and Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. We've all probably seen the, the movies and all different kind of things happening. And um, the story behind it. And, you know, the, 
cast it down and turned into, I, I call a serpent a snake. I don't know what it was. I'm guessing a snake. <laughs> then Pharaoh also, verse 11, then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt. They also did in like manner with their enchantments. Let me tell you something about this here. There's only two forces in this whole world. And that's Jesus Christ and the evil of the prince of this world. That's it. Who do you think he's talking about there when it says Pharaoh also called, okay, his wise men were not God's wise men, <laughs> right? And the sorcerers and now magicians of Egypt? I'll give a warning to you to warn your children. Don't ever let them look at or see anything or search anything about witchcraft, magic, sorcerers. I'm telling you, it's a dark hole that they may not ever come back from. That's playing in the devil's den. You don't play there. You don't go there. You, you run. Run with everything you've got, but don't you stay in that place. Don't you ever look it up online. Don't study it. Don't read it. I'm telling you that we're not strong enough. Don't play with it. But this was Pharaoh had. You know, time and time again, we see how powerful the devil is. Okay? So, they call, so Pharaoh calls all these people. We don't know how many there is, but there, evidently there's several. There's several of the wise men. There's several of the sorcerers. Now there's several magicians. They all... Oh, they also did like manner with their enchantments, for they cast down every man his rod, and they become serpents. So they did the same thing, mocking God. You know, they're big magicians, and hey, look what we can do. Look at my snake. Good job, right? Boy, that, that devil was powerful. He's serving there. Well, what's, what's the very next thing say? Very next thing say. It said, but Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Basically, rod is snakes. Aaron's snake ate every one of them. Well, how'd that work out for Pharaoh and the magicians and the sorcerers? All of a sudden, there was no more power, was there? There never, never was to begin with. It's big smoking screen that we're always dealing with every day. That same exact thing. Boy, that looks scary. It's a big mirage not real not real for for they cast okay um let's see the next and he hardened pharaoh's heart that he hearkened not unto them as the lord had said now when you go through the 10 uh plagues here and i'm not i'm not going to spend hardly any time in any of them I just want to go through them real quick you, you most of you remember but i hadn't read this for a while and i kind of forgot about them too the first one is he turned the water into blood. Now that was something I wouldn't want to see. And when, they, when you read in here, the water, it was streams, ponds, everything. It wasn't just a certain spot he turned into blood. It was everything that they ever drank from, everything turned to blood. What, so what happens? Basically, in the beginning, Pharaoh was still mocking God. Yeah, whatever. We're not, letting your, we're not letting your people go. Then the frogs covered the land. Can you imagine frogs covering the land? Not a pleasant place. Then the dust turned to lice. Everybody knows what lice are, right? I got a story to tell you about things you can't see. Can you hardly even see lice, anybody? Can you hardly really see it? It's like it's miniature micro, right? Down in Ohio, and I know we've got enough Southerners in here to know, they got something called chiggers. Anybody ever had chiggers? Let me tell you right now. Bad. <laughs> I mean bad. You go in the woods a certain time of the year when you shouldn't be in the woods, get out of the woods. Because I felt by it, and they don't happen immediately. The next morning it's like, hmm. I said, Paula, you itching? Yeah, I am too, some. Yeah. I said, what is that? He goes, a lot of times they have ticks down there, and the ticks are micro, real little bitty ticks. And I'm telling you, she, she's my witness. How many did I have that one time on me? A couple thousand? 
I'm telling you, I was covered. It was like measles. All over from my armpits, clear down to my knees. And I'm telling you what, it itches and hurts so bad. If, if they would have told me that gasoline would have killed them, I'd have taken a bath in gasoline. Because you, I'm telling you, you can't stand it. And, you know, of course, Paula, <laughs> she loves all the details about everything. So she looks up about chiggers. She said, do you know what them chiggers do? I said, what? They burrow into you and they spit in you and that causes the... I said, what? <laughs> they spit in you and put a larva or something in you that causes... Whatever it is, I'm, I'm getting it wrong, right? Okay, see? <laughs> whatever it is, it's bad. <laughs> And I'm thinking to myself, I don't want something burrowing in me and spitting in me. But you know, and, and down Walmart, of course, Walmart has everything, right? And Walmart, if you've noticed, is privy to what area they're in. Go up to Walmart here in Plymouth and find Chigger X. <laughs> you won't find it. <laughs> Walmart, they got a shelf full. And, and uh, down in Ohio, they got a shelf full of Chigger X. I'm thinking, hmm, this might be a problem. <laughs> Anyway, we have learned to not go in the woods at certain times. It's not worth it. I don't care what was in that woods. I'm not going. But can you imagine lice that covered everything? And you read in here, because it's a long story about what happened. You read about what all these things did to people. I mean, it was torture to these people. Every time old Pharaoh, Brother Dennis, nope, not today. Not let them go today. Then he got to where, yep, I'm letting them go. Yep, that, that was enough. God, I'm letting them go. Next morning, now nah, change my mind. Not doing it. Now, this is, this is a fight between God and Pharaoh, right? It was basically God and evil because Pharaoh was evil. But it was a fight between God and evil. How many times have you fought with God in your life and won? Has anybody ever won fighting God? Read the Bible. Any story you've read in this whole entire Bible, has anybody ever won in this Bible but you fight God? How to work out for Satan himself, right? God created. He didn't create Satan. He created an angel that turned evil. Okay, he didn't create the evil. He created the angel. He was a perfect angel with made perfect music. His body was the shape of an instrument and played the most beautiful music from himself. That's what God created. What happened? Like it's been on from then and on today, power struggle. I'm going to be, I'm going to be rise above you, God. Right? When it says a third of the him and a third of the angels, it says in, I read in the Bible the angels are innumerable. So what's a third of that? <laughs> a lot. Okay, they've cast out of heaven. Cast out. So that's what we're dealing with. The hell was made for them. Never was made for us. Never was made for us. It was made for them. Well. When they become, he got power to be prince of this world that we had a choice to make with all the opposition he could throw at us because God wants a people that's going to serve him. Because we can do absolutely nothing and go to hell. There's zero work involved. Zero effort involved. I can get up, do what I want the rest of my life and don't care about anybody, anything, and I'm guaranteed I'm going to go to hell. I don't even have to question it. But you want to go to heaven? What's it going to cost you? A guy asked me once, well, what's it going to cost to go to heaven? He's trying to make fun. Like, what's it, how much money is it going to cost you? Well, it's not money. It's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you your whole life. But it's worth it. And you will have to keep giving your whole life till the day you die. You'll never give it one time and walk away and say, I did that. I'm good to go. No. You, we have to die daily to this flesh every single day, Right? Without that, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. And preparing for the battle, you know, one of these that got to me here that really I thought was very interesting, the ninth plague, 
was darkness for three days. And I don't understand this, but this is what the scripture says. It was darkness they could feel. You ever been in darkness you can feel? <laughs> I, I'm not sure how that to interpret that, but it must have been that so dark, like, like you could feel, like the sun, you can feel the sun, you know, on you, the warmth and all, you feel it. But that darkness was so deep, dark, they could feel it. That had to be pretty severe darkness for three days. I mean, blacker than black. The, what could it have been? And I'm sure Pharaoh, up to all this time, he's thinking, man, I've had nine chances. I've turned away every one of them. I'm still here, I'm still here debating. I'm still here making a deal with God about not happening today. Not this time. Maybe the 11th time I might talk about it, or 12th, right? Little did he know the 10th time was he's going to lose his child, firstborn. Then every, everyone in Egypt going to lose their firstborn. Everyone. Do you think he thought that was coming? How far are we going to push God? How far are we going to test him? How far are we going to just keep saying, not today, God? How many chances do I have left? Right? We're playing with our eternity. We really are. And, and you know, what led me to this, uh, what I was, I was praying about it and, you know, praying to God about the sermon and, you know, we can sit in this church for 35, 40 years and come every Sunday, know the Bible front to back, sing songs, praise God, and never know him. Does everybody agree with that? And never know him. We, we can be here and become stiff-necked, haughty, proud, not my day today, not, not today, God, not today. And I'm going to ask you, how, how many of you uh, can still cry? You, ch you check yourself. How many of you can come to this altar and still cry to the God who made you Amen. and loves you more than life itself? Can you still cry? Or are you too hardened? The Bible warns us, we went over it in men's meeting, the Bible warns us of hardening of your heart. Every time we deny God, our heart gets a little harder. Every time. Pretty soon, we're out the door. We're a little harder here. I, I, not today, God. I don't want to hear that. Well, you know, I, I want you to go do something or do, no, not today. When I get a little farther away. Next time, a little farther away. How many times before I'm out the door and I'm out there, and then how many times I'm driving by and I should be in here? Because my heart has turned hardened. But the love of Jesus Christ, and I will tell you, before I started this walk with Jesus Christ, I did not cry. I was raised, you cry, you're going to get beat again. You do not cry. And now, I can't quit crying. God has broke my heart. What's, what's worth it, church? Can you still cry? How much does he love us? He's doing everything he can to help us make it to him. But we have to obey. What did I read in the very first scripture? You know what makes rich people mad and famous people and powerful people mad? You tell them they need to obey Jesus Christ. Nope. You want to fight, they're going to fight you. No, they're not, they're not obeying nobody. And they don't, you don't have to be famous or rich. You can sit in this church and absolutely deny God. I'm not going to obey you. I don't care who's preaching what. I don't care. You don't know what sister so-and-so did to me, and I'm not. Uh-uh. Forget it. Right? Can you be forgiven if you have unforgiveness in your heart? Tell me that. And who's the one that we worry about forgiveness? Jesus Christ. 
There is no forgiveness without being, being forgiving other people. I talked about this with a couple ladies yesterday. You know, it, I was already on this before they said a word. Unforgiveness will kill us worse than any cancer can kill the flesh. It will destroy us. If we can't forgive, we're done. And I'm sure if we're not forgiven, forgiving, we're not crying at the altar either. Because it takes a heart that's broken and moldable that God will use, and you cry for your brothers and sisters to help them. I cry for my children and my grandchildren. God help them. We got one shot at this church. We got one shot. Who knows when death angel. You know, the death angel doesn't mean when he comes you're going to heaven. It means you're dead. The flesh has to die once. With Jesus Christ, we only have to die once. With the devil, we die twice. Right? But you think about that. You think hard about that today. When that knock comes on your door, you know, I've heard people say, I, I spend my whole life being healthy, and I work out, I run, I do this, I only eat, you know, lettuce and grass. And, and you know what? They're going to die just like I will, unaware. You think you've guaranteed yourself more time? Does it hurt to take care of your body, and is it wrong? No. But don't put your salvation in it. That, oh, I'm going to live to be 90 the rate I'm going. Look how healthy I am. Let me know how that works out for you. Because we're all appointed at a time to die. And if you ever noticed, you ever looked at obituary, does, does everybody die at the age 71 or 2? Does everybody die at that age? It's from little fellows to 100-year-old people. So you tell me where this is all figured out that if I do this, Brother Bob, I can, I'm going to make it for years. Go ahead and keep telling me that. Tell yourself that until that. Then you tell the death angel it's not, not time. What are you going to do when that death angel comes and it's some time for judgment? What am I going to do? We kneel before Jesus Christ. And, and by the way, the proud and haughty ones, you will kneel if he's got to bust your legs down. Nobody gets out of kneeling before Jesus Christ. Read it. Nobody. I don't care how great you are, how smart you are, how, what, you know, what success you've had in this world that you're somebody, and everybody looks at you as, oh, look what brother so-and-so did with his life. Man, to be him. I don't want to be him. I want to be remembered in that casket when it's right there. It's like Brother Dale tried to help people, and I love people. I don't want to take from people. I want to help them. Amen. There was a day in my life I was the worst one in this church. I'm not that. That man died in that water. Amen. He died in the water. Amen. But, but listen, what are we going to do when we kneel before God? Yeah, I, I thought about this last night. I'd like Brother Jim. God woke me up, Brother Jim, at 2.30. I don't know what time he deals with you, but 2.30 seems to be my time. And I know the first thing I would do if he tells me, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. I would beg him with everything I had, God, give me one more chance. God, give me one more chance. Let me have one more try. Please, don't, don't do that. Let me, you know, how much are we going to beg for that one more chance when our race is run? It's too late, Brother Sean. When that death angel knocks, it's too late. There's no do-overs. Right now, as long as you're breathing, there's a do-over. Yeah. Yeah. If you've got breath in your life, and I thought about this too, I'm just sharing everything that God, me and God talked about. I know that sounds crazy, but you, you know what? If you were baptized 40 years ago in this church, because I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that's gotten baptized that really never understood what the baptism is all about. Because, you know, when you read Acts 2.38, let's go there real quick. I know that you've read this a gazillion times, and I know Pastor Howard's preached it a gazillion times. That's okay. Let's look at something.
Acts 2.30. Let me just go to 37 first. I, don't, I never like to leave this out. Now, when they heard this, obviously this is where they healed and what name they healed by and, you know, all that before. You can read all this. It's an outstanding chapter. But 37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Notice what Peter said here. Then Peter said unto them, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Did I leave something out? Repent. Repent is before baptism. Have you ever really thought about that? The ones getting baptized ever really thought about that? Without repentance, there's no salvation. We have to repent of our sins. And repenting of our sins is turning away. We, we have to understand that. If you got baptized and you didn't understand it, and you've been years and years, and you never received the gift of the Holy Ghost because you've never spoken tongues, you, and you, are, you feel like you're a failure. You feel like you're, you're some, there's something messed up with you. Something's wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. And I will encourage you. You got one chance at this. I got one chance at this. If I thought I had messed up on this and I did it wrong, I'd be the first one back in that tank and understanding my repentance first, and I'd be the first one back in that tank, I want to be born again, and I want to know that I did it right. Amen. Not that they didn't say the words over me right. I want to know the right steps to do. Because why do you think so many are baptized and fall away? Let's read on here. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. For the what? Remission. What's remission of sins? What is, what is remission of sins? Anybody tell me that? What's that, Pastor? Remove them and stop them. Stop. That's where we lose it sometimes. When we're young, we get baptized early, we go to the water. We can't continue sinning. It needs to be preached. Repent of the sins you know you've done, and when you get out of that water, stop the sin. You know when you're sinning. Don't ever tell me. I know every time I do something wrong. I don't care if it's that big. By the time I knew it. I knew I did it wrong. I felt wrong. I, did, I knew it. That's the Holy Ghost inside of us with conviction. But we've got to stop the sin. Without stopping that sin... You are, you're just cruising right out the door. You have no depth. You have no roots. You, have no, you, you don't have anything to hold on to because you didn't follow the Bible. Obey God. What do you, how do you obey God? Obey the Bible. This is God right here. This is, that's God in his entirety. In the beginning was what, Brother Tommy? The Word. There's the Word right there. That's it. There is no other truth, no other way, no other life, no nothing. That's it. One faith, one Lord, one baptism. Brother Dennis, all right here. Every word. That is the life of Jesus Christ. And I honestly believe when we open this Bible up like this, we can't see it, but there's a beam of light going to heaven from that Bible. That's the living God right here. And I can't stress enough, church, when all of us ministers, we preach, you go home, you read and read and read and read, and then read more. Follow everything that we said it, find it, you read it. You find it, you read it. It needs to be in your heart. You know, if this was any other way, there don't, only the ministers of the world would have a Bible. Think about that. Because we're just going to tell you what the Bible says. You know how many churches do that? They'll leave the Bibles in the car. Well, the pastor said this. How are you backing it up? You don't even read it. Back it up. Our salvation needs to be election sure, meaning read this Bible. But I am serious. I don't know why I said this today or who it was for, but I am telling you, 
don't play with your salvation. Because it's coming. It's coming. Look how many funerals we've had in the last two years. It's not, it's not slowing down. And the battle's coming, church. Battle's coming. We are the most, you know, I, I, I read on, of course, you know, I don't like Google, but sometimes I go to it and see what it says. But you know what I mean? I, me and Google don't have a great relationship. But from like, I think it was 20 years ago till now, the statistics is the people that serve God go to church. Well, I, I might say serve God. Go to church. The percentage is down like 40%. It's down, and it keeps shrinking every year of the people attending church. We're disappearing, church. The louder voices are taking over our rights and our freedom in our life. We can't, we, we can't let that happen. we got to stop it. We are the children of God. We, there's some of us here that may have to die for his namesake. Okay? It may be me. It may be you. It may be my, my kids. maybe my grandkids. But somebody's going to die for his namesake. You want to know why? Because it says it right here. Not because I'm dreaming it up. It says it right here. Now, how serious are you going to be when you got a gun to your head and say, you deny Jesus Christ or you're dying? Who's strong enough? Who's going to say, pull the trigger? Like Paul, either way, I'm the winner. Either way. That sounds good to talk it. What about, weren't you? You need to think about this, church. The battle's coming. The change of this world are faster than we can keep up with right now. And the, Bible, the Revelation warns us it's the end times. Right. It's going to get worse. This is not going to get better. Don't sit back and think, oh, the next whoever's going to fix everything. It's not going to happen. Revelation will be filled. Every jot and every tittle will be fulfilled. That's Bible. That's not my opinion. That's Bible. So if you're on the fence, if you're playing church, I beg you. Come to the altar. Get, be real. If you don't know if you've done this whole thing right and you haven't sp spake in tongues for years, you don't, maybe you never have since you've been baptized, but you don't want to tell anybody, listen, we're all in this together. We have to make it. Okay? Nobody's looking down on anybody for anything. You know why? Because none of us are any better than each other. I don't care who you are. You're not better than me, and I'm not better than you. Because... We're that gray or that, that casket? Tommy, there is no separation of value. <laughs> We're all the same. We're dead. Right? So what are we playing with? What are we messing with by playing church? It's time to get real. And it's time to question yourself and challenge yourself. Am I going to be strong enough? The only way we're going to be strong enough is stay 100% connected to Jesus Christ and his word. If you, we walk away from this word, we've walked away from life and the guarantee of life. Would you all stand? I, I, I would like to challenge you today because, you know, I've had this in my life and it's been an emotional time. What if I told you there is a father, heavenly father, waiting up here for you? And ah, I got to get this out. And uh, he's got his arms open wide. And he's saying, come home, come to me. You that are heavy laden and burdened, I'll give you rest. How many would not want to be held by the Savior and hold you tight and say, don't worry, I've got this? Because you're all fighting something bad. You don't think, I can't feel it? Every one of us are fighting a battle that half of us don't even know what's going on, but we're all fighting a battle. How many would want to crawl in the arms of Jesus and say, don't let me go? Hold me, fix me, change me. Whatever you got to do to me. Me and Paula prayed all the time, and yeah, it has consequences, but they're good. I don't care they're good. God, whatever it takes, I can't miss heaven.
Don't let my family miss heaven. Don't change me. Guide me, lead me, direct me, but don't let me go off on a path that I've never returned from. Let me love my brother as I need to love my brother. Let me forgive when I need to forgive. Let me help others when I'm challenged to help others. Let me hear your voice when you talk to me. Don't let me be hardened. Don't let my heart get hardened where I slowly am going out the door. It's time to come home, church. Come home to Jesus Christ. He's waiting here with open arms. He wants to, he knows what's great about him. He can hold every one of us at the same time. And cry to him and tell him you love him and you ask for forgiveness. We need to repent every day. If you think you're too good for repentance, you better check yourself. We're all sinners saved by grace. Right? He wants us to repent. He wants to forgive us. But we have to ask. We can't be proud and think we don't need forgiveness. We all need forgiveness. As they start a song, let's all come. Let's all pray. God bless each and every one of you. We love you all. If you need prayed for, come up after the, uh, we start praying and we'll pray for you. As I kneel in